everyone who is present. I am talking to you from uh, Bangalore. And under the auspices of Bangalore chapter of IACTA, that is the Forum of Cardiac Anesthesiologists, Indian Association of Cardiothoracic Surgeons, Indian College of Anesthesiologists, and Bangalore chapter of uh, Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine, I welcome you to this uh, Sunday webinar. And uh, before I actually invite the faculty who are uh, internationally well known, uh, I would like to uh, request you to mute your mics and keep the videos off till the end of the session. And please put your questions or comments in the chat box. After the talk, if you want to unmute yourself and put on your video, you are most welcome to do it to ask your questions or a comment uh, or add to the content of the talk today. With this, I am grateful and privileged to have Dr. Suresh Rao and Dr. Rajesh Arya. Both of them are highly accomplished cardiac anesthesiologists with uh, great passion for the transesophageal echocardiography. And I request Dr. Suresh Rao to take over and uh, conduct the proceedings. Thank you uh, so much. Yeah. Very good morning. Thank you, Dr. Mulidhar, for the kind introduction and also inviting me for this uh, breakfast session. Uh, I think uh, ECMO has become uh, a part and parcel of the cardiac anesthesiologist uh, uh, area of work. And uh, ECHO is very useful in these uh, uh, kind of situations. And uh, we have Dr. Rajesh Arya, who, who will be speaking on this uh, topic. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rajesh Arya probably doesn't require any kind of introduction. Uh, he is the one who started the IACTA Eco Library, and he was the secretary of IACTA and presently is the registrar of the Indian College of Cardiac Anesthesia. So, without uh, wasting much, much time, I will request uh, Rajesh to proceed with this uh, talk. Thank you, Rajesh. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Dr. Murli, for giving me a chance to be present uh, for this academic uh, program. And uh, thanks to Dr. Suresh Rao, uh, our ex-president of IACTA, and uh, for the kind words he has uh, spoken about me. Uh, this is all about me. And uh, today's topic assigned to me is uh, echocardiography in ECMO. Uh, I hope I am audible, sir, Dr. Rao, sir. You are audible, Dr. Rajesh. Okay, thank you. And uh, I am working in a Hero DMC Heart Institute, which is a part of uh, Diana Medical College, Ludhiana. And, uh, and I don't have any financial disclosure. Only disclosure is to share the knowledge and uh, share the uh, uh, whatever little I know about uh, echocardiography to others, because I strongly believe uh, in Hindi or Urdu, they call it Ilm ko jitna baanto ki utna badega. More you spread the knowledge, more you gain the knowledge. And that is the basic principle I follow. By teaching others, I basically learn for myself. Uh, now coming to the topic, uh, let me just set my screen. ECMO is a rescue therapy which is used mainly to provide cardiac and or the respiratory support because when the patient is unstable with a lot of our drugs and inotropes and other things, ventilator and all, still the patient is not popping up and the tissues are not getting enough oxygen, then we need to support uh, extracorporeal elements. Out of the body, we take the blood and we oxygenate, take out CO2 and then reperfuse that blood to the patient so that the tissue oxygenation is maintained with the help of an external system instead of the heart and patient's own lung. Uh, basically, to in brief, there are two, two types. When we are just supporting the lungs, there is veno venous sigma, which provides basically oxygenation and CO2 removal from the body. The heart functions, is, functions are normal. And when the heart functions are also affected, we call it the veno arterial ECMO, where we support the cardiac functions. The pumping function of the heart is again supported by the machine along with the exchange of gases. Then when we do, when we need echocardiography for this, uh, th these patients, echocardiography is normally required. Uh, when we select the patient, whether this patient needs a ECMO or not, 
so eco gives us quite clear directions and uh, directives whether the, we, we should put ecmo in this patient or not then once we decided that this patient needs an ecmo then we need to insert different cannulas and to insert the cannulas at proper place and uh, proper uh, position we need uh, the support we need a third eye for the surgeon uh, which is eco uh, to to place the cannulas we need to monitor once the cannulas are in place we need to monitor whether they are they are functioning properly whether they are draining and reperfusing the blood properly into the patient and if there is any uh, complication the eco helps us to find out those complication and finally when we remove the eco uh, it, it gives us a guide or a uh, objective criteria we can find whether this patient will behave properly or the heart and the respiratory functions are good enough that the extra carpal support can be removed from the from that patient now coming by one by one for all these aspects how the ecmo can help us patient selection uh, there may be certain uh, causes of uh, hemodynamic instability which can be reversed so with eco we can find out whether these reversible causes are there and if there are reversible causes we treat them and we can avoid putting an ecmo to those patients suppose in v ecmo if there is aortic dissection or aortic valve regurgitation the placement of uh, uh, central cannula or placement of uh, arterial cannula may be may be uh, contraindicated because the lv will descend because of the uh, high flow blood coming into the aorta from the extra corporeal circulation and if there is severe vas arterial vascular disease peripheral vascular disease if you find a uh, uh, atheroma or mobile atheroma or some obstruction to the uh, iliac vessels or other things then probably avoid the placement of uh, arterial cannula in, in those those situation from the femoral artery and they may become a relatively uh, some some contraindications for placement of arterial cannula uh, suppose there is a patient with aortic dissection so if the patient has got aortic dissection the ecmo probably may not be a good choice because there might be multiple leaks in the uh, intima which can was the the false lumen to uh, to distance much more than uh, the the normal lumen and may be harmful to the patient then if we are thinking of the vv vv ecmo if there is severe pulmonary hypertension or a cardiac failure you should go for the vena arterial ecmo because with a pulmonary hypertension if you are giving the blood back to the venous side it might increase or there may be a lot of pulmonary vascular resistance which will not be good for that the particular patients the lungs might not take the volume uh, or the high volume which is high pressure volume which is pushed by the uh, ecmo circulation so in those patients ecmo can the eco can tell us that this patient probably requires va ecmo rather than the vv ecmo then uh, there might be certain right heart abnormalities like atrial septal defect interseptal aneurysms patent foramen ovale or chair in network or um, pacemaker or icd leads which can uh, which can uh, really make a difference whether how to put the uh, the venous cannula and uh, other things and there are few examples if you see this patient has got cherry network which which might obstruct your venous cannula or which might damage the in, uh, uh, network and uh, other complications can happen uh, uh, cherry network as you all know this is a uh, uh, i mean see like a structure which is moving freely it is extension of the rough part of uh, right atrium and bicable views mostly used for this uh, then there may be intraatrial aneurysm septal aneurysm septal aneurysm is if the septum the membranous part of the septum it is moving more than 1 cm in both the direction we call it aneurysm this aneurysm may interrupt the flow or may interrupt the uh, may get stuck to the to the venous drainage cannula and uh, may not allow the venous drainage properly so one has to be very careful if if you find such a situation and then atrial uh, septal defect pattern for an oval all these things may may defer your uh, placement of cannula and uh, you may may land up with a situation that you are draining both the atrias and which is not not very helpful because the tissue extraction will be suffering uh, because of the venous uh, drainage from the left side also then after the patient selection once we have decided that this patient needs an ecmo which type of ecmo and where the cannula are the are placed uh next comes the insertion on correct placement of cannula how how eco helps so echocardiography can visualize the correct position of both wires and the cannula whenever we put a wire wire is a 
uh, good reflector uh, surface for the ultrasound waves. So when the ultrasound waves fall on the wire, uh, they're reflected back and it is it looks on the equal as a very bright shadow. And uh, we can see with the movement of wire that where our wire is placed. As you see in this picture, uh, you can see the wire, wire here. And this wire is, is reflecting the uh, uh, ultrasound waves. And it is exactly uh, very clearly seen like this in this patient. In the wire is in the femoral artery through femoral artery to the aorta. And aorta in the long axis, we can see the wire. Try to look the wire in the long axis because the short axis it brings very pointed thing which might not might not be captured in the uh, ultrasound. Similarly, with the placement of cannula, with a high pressure coming from the aortic line, the aortic wall usually closes. And when the aortic wall is closed, suppose the LV functions are bad, the aortic wall will close and the ECMO will take, take the control of entire circulation. The closure of aortic wall uh, will, will uh, indicate that your uh, cannula is correctly placed and you are able to circulate from the femoral, uh, from the ECMO circulation to the aortic circulation of the patient. Then comes the IVC cannula. IVC cannula placement is a very tricky thing because once you place the uh, uh, wire in the femoral uh, vein, from femoral vein it goes to the inter inferior vena cava to the right atrium and it's a double stage, then it goes to the superior vena cava as well. So the, you take a bicaval view and bicaval view, you can see the uh, see, see the, the wire in the long axis because whenever you want to see any wire structure, you must look for the long axis and for long axis, of the right atrium, you must take a uh, bicaval view uh, so that the wire is seen passing from the IVC side coming to the right atrium and maybe going to the superior vena cava. And this is what the, the color picture shows. The wire is very good reflective surface for the ultrasound waves and you will see the uh, color, color uh, around the wire whenever it's in the right position. Apart from the placement of cannula, you can place the position of cannula also. Most of the time, the cannula is placed just at the RA and IVC junction. If you see this patient has got IVC cannula, which has come into the right atrium, and from right atrium, it entered the right, uh, right atrium. And here, if you see the position of cannula just at the opening of, or above the diaphragm, at the junction of RA-SVC uh, area. Because it might happen that your cannula might migrate to other structures, or if you are putting a SVC side, it might go to the coronary sinus, or it can damage the coronary sinus. So one has to be very sure where to put the cannula and how to how to uh, place the cannula properly. Yeah. Similarly, when you are putting the cannula from the superior vena cava side. If you see the cannula is coming from the SVC side, this is again a bicaval view. Uh, the cannula comes into the right atrium. You can see the wire, and then you can give some fluid, or uh, and then you can see the turbulence of that, that fluid coming to the right atrium. And uh, as we see in the minimum invasive surgery, we keep the cannula a little 1.1, 1.5 centimeter above the SVC RA junction. But here there is no operative procedure done on the, the right side. So the placement of cannula can be well, well within the right atrium from the SVC. Uh, the venous cannula should be positioned in the mid right atrium to allow optimal blood flow. Correct. If you are placing too early, it might not drain the blood from the IVC side. Or if you place too much distally, it might go to the other vena cava. So it is to be placed right in the middle of the right atrium so that it drains the right atrium properly. And if you see in these uh, these pictures, uh, the, the the cannula is is placed in the uh, in the right atrium middle, then little proximal in the right atrium, and uh, you can see the in the this is RV inflow outflow view. Uh, the left side pressure is still high, probably not draining. And now it comes into the right in the middle of the right atrium, and it drains properly. So the position of cannula is very important to, to place, where to place and how to drain it. In VA ECMO, again, we, we sometimes we put a double stitch cannula, it goes to the right atrium and goes to the uh, superior vena cava as well, so that there is proper drainage of blood from the right side. 
similarly insertion of uh, and uh, venous return cannula is also important the, ideally the return cannula should be placed in the middle of the right atrium and the excess cannula should be proximal to the ivc meaning by that you should be draining the ivc side uh, and giving return blood to the middle of the right atrium close to the tricuspid wall so that whatever the return oxygenated blood you are giving that goes to the right ventricle from right atrium and the venous side the ivc side the blood is drained which is deoxygenated blood to the ecmos circulation uh echo is essential to check the position of cannula in relation to the intraatrial septum pfo if it is present left atrium tricuspid wall and coronary sinus so one must uh, be well versed with uh, these structures where are these structures on echo whether our cannula is interrupting their uh, normal flow whether the cannula is properly placed whether there is recirculation sometimes if you put the placement cannula and the return cannula very close to each other you so you will be recirculating the blood uh, in in that situation and uh, there may be sometimes inadequate blood flow if you are if your uh, cannula is hitting the interatrial uh, septum or or any wall of the right atrium or there may be some myocardial injury if you are too, inserting too much inside uh to to the uh, to the maybe across the tricuspid wall to the right ventricle even so there is a special cannula there is a two stage uh, cannula one is the return and the one is a uh, uh, forward flow cannula both both the cannula are in, incorporating to single one you know, this is a, a avlon cannula it has got two lumens one uh, one lumen gives blood back to the patient and one lumen takes the blood from the patient the one lumen allows that deoxygenated blood this is the deoxygenated blood which is uh, taken out from the inferior vena cava and this is the uh, proximal lumen which gives the oxygenated blood and this oxygenated blood uh, lumen should be very close to the tricuspid wall so that it from the, the oxygenated blood goes from the right atrium to the right ventricle uh, and uh, the position can be checked very well with the echocardiography so we, here is what the role of echo comes then coming to the next point is monitoring during the support support once we have selected the patient we have inserted the cannulas properly then we start the ecmo and after that we we just monitor the patient with uh, with echocardiography and what other what are the things which we look for monitoring are uh, we look for any underlying lv dysfunction or, or we look for any preload or afterload if it is less or more if it is less the return will be less and if it is afterload is more the the return to the patient will will be hampered or there will be a lot of resistance and we need to go on the higher flows probably so we we'll look for uh, whether there is insufficient unloading of left ventricle uh, if there is insufficient unloading of left ventricle there will be pulmonary congestion ed by hemorrhage uh, blood stagnation in the left ventricle or myocardial injury uh, affecting the recovery so all these things we must we keep on monitoring um, uh, periodically in all the patients so that our ecmo runs properly and the patient is benefited uh, so we look for afterload we look for afterload by by looking at the aortic wall closer we look for afterload by looking at the lv size lv thrombus we look for myocardial contractility and diastolic volumes and aortic wall opening as you see in this patient the aortic wall is closing periodically so maybe uh, normally it is close uh, if the functions are heart functions are poor it will be closed most of the time if the heart is pumping well and if there is uh, still not unloaded heart which is pumping well the aortic valve may not close and it will open up with every contraction of the ventricle uh, this is overloaded heart uh, you see that aortic wall is closed uh, it's not seen in this view but if you can see the left ventricle the size of left ventricle is really really big uh and if you see this patient there is adequate um, uh, offloading of the patient uh, probably the myocarditis patient uh, in which the ivp and ionotrophs were put so unloading and uh, after loading of, of of the cardiac uh, for the for the better cardiac functions or better recovery or better rest of the heart can be seen with echo then uh, adequate uh, lv unloading is vital because you can decide with the inotropes you can come down on inotropes whether you need to put a ibp or uh, sometimes if there is not uh, well unloaded uh, you need to do septostomy uh, just create a pfo or uh, hole in the septum so that lv left side is unloaded to the right side or may may need to put a lv vent that's a surgical procedure 
or uh, uh, anti grade or retrograde lv unloading can be done these are a few pictures if there is not proper unloading the lv may, might distend or if this is uh, empty lv is uh, probably uh, good for the patient so that it can recover from from the insult whatever it had and there are few few papers uh, which have come you can uh, i mean i'll share this presentation you can read those paper papers how to look for it uh, this is un unloaded hurt and uh, after after un un unloading this 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 is how it looks this is uh, i mean left ventricle is filled with volume which is not getting emptied and now after getting emptied uh, it's it's good uh, that uh, emptying is there and uh, better coronary circulation is there better lv functions are there and gives stress to the left ventricle apart from uh, arterial side uh, left side unloading we must look for the venous side unloading also and for venous side unloading the size of the ivc is mostly taken as whether there is adequate preloading of the patient or not and uh, whether this patient is overfilled or underfilled and how much is the return is the return good to the ecmo or or it is hampered a liver congestion is a sign of uh, under uh, uh, sign of uh, over preload excess preload or inadequate drainage by the venous cannula and this is how we look for the venous flows uh, normally th th this is uh, before the ecmo the venous flows are high and once we have unloaded the, we have unloaded the patient we have drained out the patient the the ecmo the, the venous uh, profile goes down means there is no forward flow the from uh, venous side to the uh, right atrium and as the blood is being taken by the ecmo so the amplitude of the waves that that comes down then the monitoring of uh, other hemodynamic uh, are uh, increased whenever you find an increased mixed venous oxygen you decrease the pvr and uh, decrease the rv afterload also or increase the, it increases the coronary oxygen content and increases the lv ejection fraction then uh, once you have uh, you are monitoring uh, the patient with uh, uh, eco uh, after patient selection placement of cannula and monitoring sometimes there might be certain complications of ecmo uh, uh, circulation or ecmo cannulas and which we can find out with echocardiography and uh, uh, ecmo complications may be because of the anticoagulation they may be bleeding and thrombosis or because of the cannulas so cannula may be displaced or flow obstruction because once you establish the flow the 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 heart size tend to reduce the liver size tend to reduce and with the reduction in the size the cannula might migrate forward or backward so after the establishment of flow one must look for any change any change in the cannula position and let's see few of the examples and uh, this is the example of thrombosis the left as there is stagnation of blood and the aortic wall is closed so the stagnant blood if there is no adequate uh, hypernization or anticoagulation this stagnant blood might clot in the left ventricle so must look for the left ventricle cavity if there is any new clot formation and then uh, the anticoagulation should be adequately addressed for that uh, then the thrombosis in the root of uh, uh, aortic wall or the root of aorta and uh, the aortic wall so as the ecmo starts there is closer of aortic wall because of the continuous uh, for continuous pressure in the aorta the aortic wall is closed especially in the patient with poor lv functions where the lv is not generating not opening the aortic wall so because of the con continuous closure of the wall there is stagnation of the blood at the root of aorta and these are the few examples you can uh, you can you should look for uh, that there is thrombosis in the opening of aorta uh these are the examples you can see there is uh, thrombosis of uh, at the root, root of aorta and one must be very careful when you find such situation look for your anticoagulation and probably while weaning up especially you must be very careful this might much dislodge anywhere uh because of the cannula position there may be obstruction to the uh, ivc the leven splenic vessels might congest because the hepatic vein tending to the ivc might be obstructed by the venous cannula or there will be svc syndrome and reduced cerebral perfusion as, as well because if you are giving a forward flow into the right atrium 
the venous drainage from the superior vena cava is obstructed and there may be cerebral uh, um, uh, over congestion or cerebral congestion and uh, cerebral edema because of increased svc pressure uh, this is example of ivc block you can see the the dilated inferior vena cava uh, there may be superior vena cava obstruction uh, which is this is transthoracic view uh, there might be some some amount of tamponade which is which is not physiologically significant this star shows the tamponade and as we are on ecmo it is not not affecting the cardiac functions because we are controlling the cardiac functions from from the pump but once we try to come off this this uh, tamponade fluid may cause uh, this pericardial effusion may cause tamponade effect and may not let the cardiac functions work normal so that's an issue one must look for look for uh, any any uh, pericardial effusion or which which may result in tamponade uh, the cannula position cannula might hit the interatrial septum it might go to the coronary sinus it might go across the tricuspid wall into the right atri right ventricle and may may go to the left side uh, through the peritoneal foramen or well so this is a diagrammatic presentation and uh, this is how the, this is uh, this is the place where it is hitting the interatrial septum so once we have uh, looked for it, there is no complication then it, uh, the stage comes that we need to remove the ecmo we feel that patient's functions are normal the cardiac functions are normal the lungs have recovered and we can gradually wean off and uh, take out the ecmo at that moment again the role of ecmo comes to decide whether this patient is fit for removal of ecmo uh, circulation or not so uh, it it ecmo helps in deciding winning and recovery when it should start and how it should start uh, the protocol for winning depends on patient to patient and institute to institute some people go for venous uh, saturation some people go for echocardiography some people go for other factors but definitely it plays a major role in deciding whether the patient can be off for ecmo circulation or not so it's a clinical judgment uh, hemodynamic parameters and finally the eco variables which we look for while coming off uh eco cardiographic parameters which are possibly uh, help you to make a decision of uh, the ef should be more than 35% at least the left ventricular and diastolic diameter should be less than 55 it means the left ventricle is not dilated the aortic velocity time integral should be more than 10 that shows the forward cardiac output generated by the left ventricle uh, the aortic wall opening pattern should be normal and there is should be absence of any lv dilatation so once these things are there then you can probably think that we can go off the ecmo provided other clinical parameters and uh, uh, biochemical reports are normal uh, we decrease the va ecmo support uh, the decreasing the ecmo support determines a reduction in lv afterload and increase in the lv preload so by by decreasing the ecmo support we are we are decreasing the lv afterload because ecmo sir flow is reduced and we are increasing the preload because we are not draining much so conventional eco request parameters are dependent on the loading conditions so we must make sure that there is enough loading conditions to the patient he should not be hypovolemic and he should not be overloaded as well so these are the few papers which show that uh, the systolic velocities uh, of the mitral lens and that is tissue doppler indices are very useful because these are relatively mostly afterload and preload in, independent and they can tell us that the lv contractions are good or not whether it is underfilled or overfilled most of the time the tissue doppler gives you the contractile function of the myocardium and if the tissue doppler indices are normal you are happy that you can probably go ahead with winning off so these are all the roles of eco during a uh, uh, ecmo patient on ecmo and uh, i thank again for all of you uh, for a patient listening and happy to take any questions uh, and i'm sure the presence of dr suresh will help me out to answer most of your queries thank you thank you rajesh for the excellent uh, presentation uh, i think most of the points uh, you have highlighted and explained well uh, just uh, make few comments Uh, see in our center cardiac anesthesiologists we will only insert the cannula so what we do is first we will image the femoral artery and the femoral vein 
So we look at the size because we need to determine the size of the cannula. So femoral artery will measure depending upon the diameter. We will decide whether it is 17 French or 19 French. And also we look at the, of course, the theroma, all those things uh, you have mentioned. The second point is uh, distal perfusion cannula. See, all these patients, uh, once you put the femoral artery cannula, there may be a distal limb ischemia. So you need to puncture the distal femoral artery also. And in this condition, this uh, ultrasound is very useful. So we puncture under uh, ultrasound guidance. Uh, other thing is any cannula placement, no, we'll puncture under ultrasound guidance. That is very important in percutaneous uh, cannulation because by chance you puncture the femoral artery, vein, then artery or artery and then vein. So you can have AV fistula, all kind of situations. So by, I mean, it's a routine practice to puncture these vessels under ultrasound guidance only. Uh, mm -hmm. Second thing is uh, you well mentioned about the LV dysfunction. So if there is severe LV dysfunction, probably we will be hesitating to put peripheral uh, ECMO because as you said, the LV afterload increases. So it will result in pulmonary edema. So we will see whether we can cannulate the subclavian artery. That is one option. Or we will be prepared for uh, LV distension and uh, decompressing the uh, LV. The other thing is, uh, see, when you are having a LV distension, after increased afterload, other option is to empty it using the impella. So if you are inserting the impella again, uh, the placement of the impella uh, T and uh, echo plays a major, uh, 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 I mean, major, it helps in a major way. And also, usually these patients will require uh, wedge pressure monitoring. So most of the time, they'll be on pulmonary artery catheter, especially in veno arterial ECMO. Uh, this is also useful in uh, while weaning of the ECMO you will be monitoring which pressure, so whether we can wean off the uh, ECMO or not, you'll know. So the placement of PA also, once patient is on ECMO, to locate whether the PA is properly placed or not, sometimes uh, it is useful. Uh, other thing is we are talking about the VV ECMO. So obviously you mentioned the distance between the distal ports of two uh, cannulae, that is the IVC cannula and the return cannula, it should be proper, I mean, it should be a pro the recirculation should not happen. If they are too close, there will be recirculation. Too far, your drainage may not be good. So what is the ideal uh, distance between two cannula? It's around nine centimeter. So we will make sure that in the beginning itself, the distance between the two cannula are around nine centimeter. Then after that, depending upon the recirculation, probably uh, we will, uh, adjust the placement of the cannula. And sometimes uh, we also see the IVC, collapsed IVC. Then we know that uh, patient is hypovolemic. So in those conditions, uh, we give volume, make sure that the IVC is uh, uh, somewhat filled. It should be not totally uh, distended and also it should not be collapsed. I think with these comments, uh, there are some uh, questions. So I'll ask uh, uh, just- I, uh, I could read the, those questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> one of the question is uh, the role of 3D. To be very uh, I mean, truthful, 3D has, uh, 2D gives you most of the information what you need, except when you look for the uh, walls and all, might go for 3D because it requires time and other thing. 2D is good enough for uh, monitoring and uh, placement of cannulas and everything. Second question is asked is, uh, is it a T only or a transfer she can work? To that, my answer is that these patients are mostly sick. Uh, there were a lot of tachycardia when we are planning for to put the ECMO and uh, uh, they are on ventilator. So in that, that situation for the initiation of ECMO, I think that T should be done. And uh, once the patient, once we have seen that cannula position and the ECMO is set, then probably we can take out the T and uh, shift the shift to the uh, to the transfer acid because the ventilation will be on a low profile. Even we can stop the ventilation also when we are doing uh, transfer acid echo. And for weaning off also, I think transfer acid should be enough because when we are weaning off ECMO, 
uh, though the patient is intubated, but uh, we can see most of the things with the transfer receipt. About the placement of a distal perfusion cannula through the dorsal pedis, I have no experience because in our place, most of the perfusion cannula is put in the profunda vessel. So uh, I can't uh, comment on, on that whether dorsal pedis should be used. Awake ECMO, obviously, when, once you're doing a awake ECMO, then the role of uh, transesophageal is reduced considerably. Only the transthoracic will help you out. And definitely what Dr. Suresh also said about uh, peripheral echocardiography for the vessels placement cannula, absolutely, I did not touch that topic uh, in my presentation, but definitely his comments are very much required, uh, essential for any placement of cannula. You must go under ultrasounds, the size of vessel, the cannula, the AV fistula issue, all this uh, the, the, your probe should be most of the time on the femoral vessels when you are putting a peripheral cannula through femoral. How to solve the hepatic congestion post uh, IVC cannula insertion? Once you find the hepatic veins are dilated, it means that the, your cannula is obstructing the uh, drainage from the hepatic vein to the IVC. You must reposition your cannula and make sure that the hepatic veins are not congested and they are draining into the IVC. Otherwise, uh, hepatic congestion will disturb all your <laughs> all your biochemical parameters and uh, liver congestion will disturb all your patient management. In uh, during VA ECMO, is IBP useful in LV distinction? Uh, IBP, presence of IBP is always a query in my mind. Why should we put the IBP? Will it help or will it, will it harm? The, the question is mostly unanswered. I always ask this question in all the presentations of ECMO. To me, IBP is harmful when you are going in a femoral arterial cannulation for ECMO. Uh, it, will, uh, it will harm the patient, but there are reports that put the IBP in the, uh, in the patient with the femoral ECMO. So, in VA ECMO with femoral artery use for the perfusion, the IBP I personally find it should be removed, and it won't won't help in uh, L LV to prevent the LV distension because ECMO is pushing one side and IBP is reducing one side of the ascending aorta pressures. So, so I think it it should be removed before before putting. It. Uh, uh, thank you, Rajesh. I think Sanjay Orati is there who is working in. My center as the adult uh, cardiac surgical unit. Uh, Sanjay, would you like to say something on these issues which have been raised? The balloon pump per se is always a surrogate vent for the LV. Yeah. In peripheral ECMO, we tend not to use an IABP, but in central ECMO, it has been used, and we usually put it at one is to three of uh, ratio with 50% augmentation. That's what we would normally do. Now, the usual sequence of event in a cardiac theater with cardiogenic shock or post cardiogenic cardiogenic shock is you try to come off bypass, you've not been able to do so, you put in a balloon pump, and then you realize that you still can't come off, and then you initiate central V ECMO. So you already have a balloon pump there. Now, the gold standard for venting the LV is always an LV apical vent. Now, that is a big bone of contention because a lot of people will argue that if the LV is down, should we actually plumb a line into the LV apex? And will it cause scarring and then subsequently cause a bigger headache when we come off ECMO? Unfortunately, that is a myth. Now, normally, the best way to decompress an LV is to put an LV apical vent. Doing an intraatrial septostomy or putting an LA vent or a superior pulmonary vent or advancing the the LV. But if you do have a balloon pump in central VA ECMO, it can still to a certain extent offload the LV. It's not a great way to do it, but you could always argue that yes, when we're weaning off VA ECMO after seven to 10 days, yes, it would come in helpful. But the jury is out there for that. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, Suresh Rao, do you want to add anything on this IABP in ECMO? What is your uh, take on that? No, I agree with uh, Dr. Sanjay. In our center also, most of the time, they will be on uh, IABP. So we'll continue right. the IABP. 
uh, as he said, it uh, slightly helps in afterload reduction. It is not that it is inflating during the aortic valve opening. So it is inflating, I mean, it's inflating only during aortic valve closure. So it should not cause any issues. But there are there may be some mechanical issues. And so usually we continue with the AV. Yeah, that is true. Uh, Dr. Sanjeevani, you wanted to know something from Rajesh. Can you please pose your question? One of the questions oh. is uh, right sided congestion by echo. Can you know the yeah. effect of right sided congestion? So, whenever we are winning of uh, VV ECMO specifically, uh, we, we get across one day the X ray is absolutely white, the next day X ray is absolutely. Uh, normal looks black uh, the lungs fields so that's a very tricky situation because in the uh, you are draining into the right atrium and they're pushing back into the right atrium both both ways the right side so one has to be very dynamic with their flows and looking at the lung ultrasound as well as the cardiac echo uh, to find out what is the optimal filling for that particular patient so a little bit of extra filling will make the lungs white and uh, back back to square one and uh, if you are under filling Probably once uh, you are off the ECMO, the, the pressures might not generate. So the, the decision is very dynamic and on the bedside of the patient continuously doing transthoracic, looking for the uh, filling pressures, looking for the LA pressures, then you decide how to go about it. Another question, during winning, we should avoid underloading and over distension. Many parameters are taken account in account. Winning from ECO, winning with ECO will reduce close and simultaneously assess the functions of LV and RV and uh, win gradually. Or should we reach the flow less than two liters per minute and just we in ECMO, what is your abnormal approach? Normally, we uh, we come to the two liters and wait for some time, for a day or uh, for eight hours or 24 hours, just two liters. And the, if the patient is generating good pressures, the aortic wall opening is adequate, regular, the rhythm is stable. Then after that, we go fast from two liters to stopping the ECMO. Because these machines, uh, less than two liters with patients on uh, pressure generated aortic pressures, um, uh, quite quite good generated aortic pressure by the patients on cardiac contractility. The machine might support, and then we have to go very fast on winning from two liters to 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 stop the machine and take the cannula out. That is what we do. Suresh uh, sir can probably tell more on that winning, final winning. Okay, see, winning in uh, VV ECMO and VV, VA ECMO are totally different. So VV ECMO, what we do is we'll continue to give two to three liters flow, but we'll switch off the sweep gas flow. So that means the venous blood drained and given back to the RA without any gas exchange. So you are assessing only the gas exchange capacity of the lung. So usually we run for 24 hours without giving any sweep gas flow. That means patient is off ECMO. The only reason we do for 24 hours is because if the patient requires reinsertion of the cannula, it's very difficult. I mean, once you remove the cannula, reinsertion of the ECMO will be challenging. So, so it doesn't matter whether you give two liter, three liter flow because there is no gas exchange. Uh, coming to the veno arterial ECMO, yes, it is challenging. Uh, it is not that easy. Uh, when is the right time to, you know, I mean, take off the ECMO because patient may tolerate uh, removal of ECMO for 24 hours, then uh, something may go wrong. But in general, we'll reduce the flow up to two liter. Uh, beyond that, you can reduce. The problem is the distal perfusion cannula. Now the flow will be less. So you may have limb ischemia and also the clot formation, all those things uh, may be more. So we increase the heparin uh, dose also. So around 1.5, one liter also sometimes we'll do. And we come off, we clamp both the femoral, art, I mean, the artery, arterial uh, uh, tube and the venous cannula, we clamp it. We will watch for uh, five to 10 minutes if the patient is tolerating well. And of course, we will uh, confirm with the echo. Then everything is well, uh, we will proceed with the uh, removal of the ECMO. Yeah, that is uh, true. In the VA ECMO, 
uh, there is an, uh, there is uh, a possibility that if there is a pulsatile flow when the patient is on the ECMO, that uh, pulse pressure of greater than 30 millimeters of mercury is expected to tell us that uh, uh, it's probably right time to start to wean, uh, think about weaning and also you have to look at the echocardiographic and hemodynamic parameters and keep a watch on them as they're reducing the flows, the aortic valve VTA or the LVOT VTA has to be greater than 10 centimeters. Uh, and uh, the LV ejection fraction, RV ejection fraction can also be taken into account when you're thinking of reducing the flows. Yeah, I think. But the VV ECMO, but the VV ECMO, they, they, have, they have described the two stage approach. First is to reduce the FIO2 to the sweep gas, which was 100%, bring it down to 21%. And turn down the sleep gas so that you are taking care of oxygen first in the first part and carbon dioxide in the second part as you are increasing the workload on the natural lungs as it is recovering. Then uh, there is no need to reduce the flows as correctly said by Suresh. And then once you have reduced the sleep gas to zero, you can uh, try to clamp the lines and then. Uh, Vino of the ventilator, vino of the ECMO in the ECMO. Thank you. Any more comments or questions? Uh, so, good morning. This is Dr. Yashwin. Can I ask a few queries? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, sure. Please go. Uh, so first is, uh, we were just talking about ECMO along with IVP or some other LV support and plus LV venting. So is it based on if uh, you have a patient which is having LV dysfunction, dysfunction secondary to say RV dysfunction or isolated LV dysfunction or biventricular dysfunction? So, I mean, considering these three kind of uh, situations, is uh, VA ECMO enough or do we have to think of um, some other strategy in the form of some other LV support, Centimag or uh, oh, yeah. Doctor, uh, Yes, Dr. Rajesh yeah. followed by Suresh and probably Sanjay. Can you please answer this question? So probably you're talking about a patient with a, a DCM uh, or a very poor ejection fractions for which whom, for whom we have put a LVAD, uh, so for, for whom we have put the ECMO. And now we are trying to come off the ECMO we, with, a presume, with a presumption that the, the LV might recover. But that's not a true situation in most of the time with these patients who are chronically on uh, decompensation, uh, LV decompensation. And uh, with the hope that uh, they might recover. If they don't recover, definitely we look for the, we give the option to, to patients uh, about LVAD or any other support. So in that case, the ECMO is used as a bridge to transplant or bridge to LVAD or uh, assist devices. Second issue is the RV dysfunction uh, combined with LV dysfunction or LV dysfunction alone or, or both of them. So that's again a situation one has to, uh, I mean, in my center, we are not uh, putting any uh, L, uh, ventricular support devices. So if that uh, Dr. Suresh can answer better. But definitely if the patient is not coming off uh, with ECMO, uh, out of ECMO, then the, uh, you look for a, a support. LV went again in my hospital. Uh, my, we have never put LV went because most of our ECMO have been uh, peripheral ECMO and uh, patient with some some other complications. Intraoperately coming off pump uh, and requiring ECMO is uh, never happened in our institute. And uh, only once with the post PTCA, uh, we we need to we we had to support one patient on ECMO. Uh, even for that, the chest was not open, so the Issue of uh, LV vent we never had in uh, our experience. Sometimes we do our surgeons do put a uh, right pulmonary vein uh, uh, venting uh, of the left ventricle. Uh, even the uh, septostomy has not been done. That is on the pediatric cases. Sometimes they do septostomy if, if uh, LV is not uh, taking or uh, the LA pressures are high. So this is about the LV venting. And about the when support devices, I would say that if the patient is not coming for FICMO, Definitely, he, he requires a, a support device. And further on this, I think Dr. Suresh can speak. Yeah, I think uh, some basic concepts uh, we need to know 
uh, in VA ECMO. One is RV dysfunction. Yes, the VA ECMO actually helps in RV recovery and also gives rest to the RV because there is a preload reduction and also the uh, RV function is taken care of. So it helps in RV dysfunction. Now coming to the LV, VA ECMO is not going to help the left ventricle recovery. It is just does the circulatory function. In fact, it does more harm to the left ventricle because there is a increase in the afterload. So in a acute MI, anything, if the patient is on VA ECMO, ventricular recovery will not be helped by the VA ECMO. So you need to reduce the afterload. That is by decompressing the LV. Either you can put a LV vent or nowadays what they do is we put the impella. So impella will reduce the afterload reduction. So it helps in the recovery of the LV. Now coming to the usage of Centrimac, that is the L LVAD. Usually when there is LV dysfunction, you can go on VA ECMO as an emergency to maintain the circulation. But your problem is only LV dysfunction. You convert VA ECMO into LVAD, Centrimac. So that LV is decompressed as well as gives the uh, circulatory function is maintained. Sometimes the lung is good, but there is LV dysfunction, there is RV dysfunction. So you can convert VA ECMO into RVAD plus LVAD. So you are not using the oxygenator so that the trauma, all those things, complication rates are less. So it depends upon which uh, ventricular function is uh, is an issue. If it is RV dysfunction, you can use VA ECMO or RVAD. If it is the LV dysfunction, ideally LVAD, but in an emergency, you can go on VA ECMO and uh, uh, decompress the uh, LV. Uh, there are a few more questions on uh, melding on liver cement and, and uh, other things. Probably those are uh, not related to the role of ECO uh, directly. So I think that can be taken uh, in some other lecture of uh, ECMO management on the drugs and uh, hemodynamics too. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Dr. Shankar also has question about the uh, precautions while putting the distal lymph perfusion cannula. Yeah, I think a uh, few points. One is the puncturing of the distal lymph, I mean distal uh, femoral artery should be ultrasound guided. But sometimes after establishing the VA ECMO, uh, you may not be able to puncture. In that case, we usually surgically expose the femoral artery, then put a distal uh, perfusion cannula. And daily monitoring of the perfusion is very important. There won't be any pulse in the dorsalis pedis. So we do uh, ultrasound Doppler to make sure that there is a blood flow in the distal uh, femoral artery. Usually it is continuous flow. And uh, what we do is we also do the, we'll put the uh, RSO to this one. We monitor what is you are using for the cerebral perfusion, I mean, uh, cerebral oximetry, no? That this one, we'll put it on both the limbs and we'll be continuously monitoring the uh, perfusion, oxygenation of the, this one. So if there is any drop, so probably we will be more... Uh, uh, cautious. So one more question. Uh, how, how do we strategize our inotropes and ventilation when patient is placed on uh, any kind of support, say ECMO or uh, Centrimac? Yeah, with the Centrimac, usually we don't need the uh, inotrope for the LV because uh, the whole purpose of LV is to uh, take care of the function of the LV. But we may need vasopressors because these patients' uh, SVR may be very low, in which case to maintain the perfusion pressure, we may have to start some vasopressors, especially they may have uh, stirs, so they may require. And uh, are we? Yes. These patients who are on Centrimac, obviously the cardiac output is good. So you have to support the RV. So usually we use... Uh, inotropes which will reduce the pulmonary vascular resistance but improves the contractility of the right ventricle. So any of this uh, adrenaline and uh, uh, 
uh, the vitamin, all those things can be useful. The choice Mildrenol depends upon your order. SVR. If they, yeah. If the SVR is high, probably Mildrenol is a better choice because it reduces the after hour, uh, RV afterload. And sometimes we also use uh, nitric oxide if the patient is on a ventilator and uh, they are nitric oxide responders. And one last question on north, south and down, sir, how do we prevent it? You know, brain getting uh, lesser oxygenated blood and the rest of the body being on ECMO getting yeah. more oxygenated. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. You mean the north-south syndrome, no? In uh, peripheral... North, south syndrome, yes, yeah, yes, Peripheral VA ECMO. Okay. So the problem is, that's why before the this one itself, we will assess the, uh, one is the lung function. If there is a severe pulmonary edema and oxygenation is poor, so peripheral VA ECMO may result in uh, uh, cerebral ischemia. So initially we put the peripheral VA ECMO because uh, it's an emergency, you have to do it. Uh, then uh, usually the right radial artery blood, no, that will be the uh, blood ejected from the heart. So if the stats are low uh, and oxygen and PO2s are low in the right uh, uh, radial artery, then that is the indication that patient may get uh, less uh, cerebral blood flow or cerebral oxygen. Uh, so first thing is to monitor and we keep the patient awake. If the patient is awake, then okay, we are okay with that. But if the patient is not awake or uh, you can't keep the patient awake, uh, then we convert it into VAV ECMO. That means the, there will be a venous drainage line in the IVC, the return uh, blood into the femoral artery. We'll connect one more uh, arterial, I mean, one more cannula in the IJV. The arterial blood is given to the, uh, that IJV cannula. That means oxygenated blood will come to RA, which will go to the lungs. Then it will be ejected by the LV. So VAV ECMO usually takes care of the North South syndrome. Apart from there okay, are other questions, that's what we use in our center. And one more thing was mentioned about retrograde flow on the VA ECMO leading to increase in the outflow that I couldn't understand. Why will there be retrograde flow? No, no. When you put a VA ECMO, peripheral VA ECMO, see the arterial Sir. blood will go in the retrograde fashion. From, from the, the femoral artery. Descending all right, all right. to, okay, okay, yeah, that way, to the ascending way. Right. So the LV afterload is increased. Understood. I thought the complete flow is reversing in the direction. No, no. Central like that's why in those conditions, central ECMO is better. Central ECMO can help the LV recovery, but peripheral ECMO will not help the LV recovery. You have to decompress the. And what what is the best modality to decompress the LV? I mean, where do we place the vent? You think LV apex is the best place or? The... L LV apex is the best, but you can also use a septal puncture. That also will take care of the uh, LV decompression. Or you can put a impella that also can uh, take care of the LV decompression. Those and also on ECO, we look for the position of the septum while the patient is on ECMO, sir. How does yeah. that really decide uh, uh, our flows and other things? Yeah, see, the problem is when there is RV distension, the interventricular septum will be into the LV. In which case you have to increase the uh, ECMO flow. On the other hand, if the interventricular septum into the RV, that means LV is distended. So in that case, either you increase the contractility of the ventricle by starting some anotropes so that okay. the septum becomes central. Or if you can't, then you will have to increase the support LV yeah. or decompress yeah. right. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, the last question is about TEE help in placement of placement of protein duo. Yeah. Do you think it uh, helps? Yeah, 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 definitely. It Is provides it? the, it? okay, sorry. Uh, it provides the RV support. So, alternatively, now we have Impel RP. So, Impel RP also, basically, it uh, it is a pump from the RV to PA. So, it decompresses the right ventricle. Right. 
uh, I think it just it is FDA approved, but India, I think once uh, one or two we have put, but uh, it's not uh, freely available. We have to request import it on a particular patient. Right, right. Thank you so much, and uh, I think we should uh, we have come to the end of the session because we just uh, exceeding the time limits. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rajesh Hari, for that excellent lecture, and Suresh Rao, Sanjay, and others who have participated. I'm grateful to them, and we will see you again next Sunday. Thank you so much. Have a great Sunday. Thank you, thank you. sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Thanks for Thank patient you. listening and a special thanks to, to Suresh sir who took my, my work of answering the questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.